Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Congregational Church. It is a beautiful morning to be here. I missed you all last weekend. I was out of town, and it's, it is great to be back, and it's great to see all of you here this morning. Just a reminder that our service will be out on Facebook, YouTube, on our website. Just be sure and share that with your friends. Offering plates are still back in the Narthex and will be brought forward during the service for doxology. Uh, annual reports for our meeting next week are on the table also back in the Narthex. Um, be sure to take one of those and you get a chance to look at it ahead of time. Very helpful for our meeting next Sunday. And we are going to zip right through here because I'm going to ask Tim to come up and talk to you a little bit more about some of our announcements here. But before I do that, I would like to formally invite you all by reading our invitation to the annual meeting for next week. All members of the First Congregational Church of Fremont, Michigan are called to come together following worship on Sunday, October 16th, 2022 for our annual congregational meeting. We will review the reports of officers, boards, and committees concerning the work they did for God in 2022, elect officers, board, and committee members for terms commencing in the year 2023, approve the updated constitution and bylaws, and adopt a budget to provide for the work we will do in Christ's name, AD 2023. We will also deal with any other business which may properly come before the meeting. Thank you so much. Many blessings for your day today. Good morning. It's a beautiful fall day. It's a great day for a soup supper. At 4.30 today, we're gonna to be doing uh, The Chosen and our dinner will be at 4.30. Um, I gotta look at my notes because I just gapped on everything. It's gonna be episodes three and four. Uh, last week was very touch, it was excellent. I, I can't keep enough on this one. Um, and then we'll start the dinner at 4.30, movies at 5.30, runs a couple of hours, so you'll be out around 7.30. Um, also, please do not forget to bring a canned good of some kind, non-perishable item, for the True North Pantry. And we didn't do this to suck up either. <laughs> um, but last week, one of the things that was in the movie, or the episode, was Jesus had two of his disciples plow this field. They didn't know what it was for. They said, well, because we're good workers. And wound up, they plowed this entire field and seeded it for a Samaritan. But these guys didn't know that. And Samaritans were very big enemies of the Jews. So it was a very good thing. And Karen and I had been talking about this. And we said, I think it would be appropriate to do a, a food drive. So please bring your canned goods. Um, and then also we follow this up on Tuesday with a Bible study. Uh, last week we had nine, nine or ten people come for the Bible study and it was just an open discussion. Uh, it will be available on a Zoom meeting so if you can't make it in just connect to the Zoom link and uh, it's really well worth it. You, you guys, it's, it's amazing how people had their input on their take on it and it was just a really good time. It was a good fellowship time. So please, if you can, consider taking some time out of your Sunday evening and enjoy a movie and some good food because, you know, church people know how to cook. Thank you much. Thank you, Tim. I, I want to... I want to just emphasize what he said. Um, I always enjoy the chosen. I always find myself sitting in the back, crying my eyes out. It's very undignified. I'm always frustrated by that. But it's so wonderful. It's such a wonderful show. And it, it really does bring a lot there. There's a lot to dig into and unpack, which is why I'm so glad this, uh, this time around they're doing the Bible study. So I really do encourage you to go. If you weren't able to make it last week, the shows are kind of standalone. They, they have a story that goes from story to story, but they do uh, connect well. So if you can make it, please do. Um, 
We have a special speaker today, Danielle from True North is here to present on True Mentors, a wonderful program that they put on. And so I just want to uh, welcome her and invite her up and please give her a round of applause as well as she comes up. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me here with you this morning. Um, I came in from Shelby, where I live, and it was a beautiful drive this morning. I came in a little early and went to True North and watched the sunrise, and my dog's actually out in my car, and we're going to go on a little stroll at Brandstrom after this. So thank you for having me and welcoming me here. Um, I oversee the True Mentors program at True North Community Services. Um, so we match positive adult role models with children in Nuego County. So one in three children in Nuego County do not have a positive role model in their life. And I want you to think about what that means. I'm gonna give you a second just to think back through your life about the mentors you have had throughout the years. When you were a child growing up, it could be a teacher, a neighbor, a youth group leader, pastor. And then we often, on our career in high school, we have a teacher we connect with or a counselor, same folks from our church. Then maybe in college or a career, someone starting out who sort of led you on your way. And think about what that person meant to you, what they helped you with, the advice they may have given you. One in three youth in Nuego County do not have anyone to turn to. These children are in difficult homes as it is, and then they are struggling to find someone to connect to, um, someone to do things with them, to talk to them about the troubles they're having at school with their friends, at home. And that's what we're asking you folks to do, to find it in your heart to spend some time with the youth. So I want to give a couple examples. We have a waiting list of children waiting for mentors, and I want to talk to you about a couple of those kids. One, his name is Elijah. Uh, he's a sixth grader at Fremont Schools. He likes architecture and building things. He has two bearded dragons at home that he takes care of. Um, and his father passed away several years ago, and they had a rough relationship as it was, and he has no other male in his life. So Elijah's looking for, he said he wants a dude to hang out with. He told me he wants to walk around town and look at some of the older buildings and hear about what they do and what kind of building it is. He wants to build things. I had the privilege of checking out your wood shop before we started the service this morning. That is something that Elijah would love. Um, and he's been on our waiting list since January. Uh, there's a little girl named Allie, um, who is a fifth grader at Nuego Public Schools. Allie um, likes art and nature and music. She's teaching herself how to play the guitar. Uh, she told me she likes to go on little walks with her family, um, with her single mom, um, to the park. And while she's on those walks, she collects leaves and pine cones and little twigs. And then she gets home and she glues them in, as artwork um, to paper. Um, so she's interested and she's never been to the arts place. Uh, she'd love to go check that out. She'd like to walk around and see the public art pieces that we are thankful to have in Fremont and Nuego County. Um, and she's been on our wait list since 2020. Um, just waiting for an adult to spend some time with her. Um, she struggles with social connection and self-confidence, so she really needs an adult to help build her up, to exposure to community events where there might be other kids, um, to a youth group, um, to help build her up and realize that she is worth it and important and someone cares about her. Um, so at True North, I have the pleasure of overseeing True Mentors as a whole, um, and we provide mentorship in a couple different ways. Um, so there is a sheet on that back table there that has a little summary and my contact information if it is something you're interested in. 
But real quick, I want to tell you a little bit about each one of these that we are in desperate need of help with. Um, So the first one is that waiting list that Elijah and Allie are both on. So we take one adult and one child and match them together based on similar interests, based on geographic area they live in, um, based on the goals and things they want to work on. Um, And that's just a one-to-one match based in the community. I do all the intake, I meet with them a couple times all together until they're feeling comfortable with each other. Then they take it on their own. They meet as their schedule allows and they work it out just between them. Often the mentor and the parent exchange, you know, I'd like to do something this Thursday night and they work out all that timing and stuff on their own. I provide support, activities, supplies, things like that. Two of our programs are based in the school districts. We have one at White Cloud Public Schools, one at Nuego Public Schools. Um, In Nuego, it's weekly, every Tuesday from 3 to 5 after school. The kids come down. We facilitate activities in small groups. So this might be more for someone who uh, isn't sure about that one-on-one mentorship, maybe doesn't have a ton of experience hanging out with kids, but could do a small group setting where we're providing an activity that you do with a small group of kids at the same time weekly. Um, The other one at White Cloud Public Schools is actually during their lunchtime, also on Tuesday. So it's from roughly 11.30 to noon. They have such odd times. I think their lunch is like 11.27 to 12.03 or something odd. Um, But so they meet during lunch doing those same activities in a small group setting. These kids are all what we would call at risk. Um, I would argue that any youth could benefit from having a mentor, but these kiddos really could. Um, They're food insecure, sometimes housing insecure, single parent households, living in extreme poverty. They could have parents who are incarcerated. Um, It's just a myriad of things that these kiddos are dealing with that we focus on. Um, And then two other programs. In Hesperia, we have peer-to-peer mentoring, Um, so we match high school kids with elementary kids, similar to like a reading buddies or big brothers, big sisters kind of deal. Um, And then the last one is partial to my heart. I'm very outdoorsy. It's called Parks in Focus. Um, So we take middle school aged kids from Nuego County camping and fishing and canoeing. Um, uh, We just recently took five kids um, camping at Pictured Rocks in the UP. These kids had never been across the bridge. They'd never been in a tent. Um, And we start the week with, I take all their cell phones from them, and they're terrified, and they just want their phone back. I'm pointing out you know, critters we see in the wild, and they're super grossed out. Um, And by the end of the five days, they have forgotten all about their phone, and they're jumping in the pond, catching frogs, um, and it's just a beautiful thing. So all of these programs, um, we need your help with. Parks in Focus is a one-off opportunity. We often are looking for adults to go take a hike with us at Brandstrom or go canoeing at Camp Nuego. These other programs are once a week for a couple hours, or the community-based mentorship, as I mentioned, is an on-your-own time. We ask for at least a year commitment. We know if an adult comes into one of these youth's lives, it doesn't work out, and they bow out before a year. It's actually would have been better off for the child if they never met that person. just adds to their sense of abandonment. So quite the commitment here for a huge impact. So we have five kids currently on our waiting list. I would love to get them matched with an adult. So I'm asking you to find it in your heart and find some time to spend a couple hours with a kiddo, and I will fill you in on how and where and help you along the way. So all my contact information is in the back, and I'm going to stay, um, and I will be around if anybody has any questions, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I think that this is such a fantastic program. Uh, I was so excited when I heard about it. Um, I can't tell you how important mentors were in my life. Um, I had a very good upbringing. I got very lucky, two parents who loved each other, who had a good job, had a good time in the economy. I had it all together, and yet the thing that made the difference between me being here and somewhere radically different is 
the fact that I had many, many people who were willing to invest in my life, throughout my life, and continue to do so. So if you have the opportunity to do so, um, or if you know someone who would be interested, uh, there are a lot, of, you know, a lot of people throughout the community, please tell them about this program. Please consider pray whether this would be something you would want to do. Um, I just think this is so wonderful, and I think this is such a great way to uh, care for our community and to really make an impact. Often we wonder if what we do, you know, the good things we do, the giving, the doing this, doing that, uh, makes a big difference. And I can tell you there is no bigger way that you can make a difference than one-on-one -on -one interacting with another person and caring for them. Uh, so thank you, Daniel, for letting us know about that. Um, I believe we have hit all the announcements. Uh, one I wanted to mention is the Hay Art will be coming down Monday. Uh, so if you were, if you, any of the men are able to help out with that, we'll probably wrap that up after men's coffee on Monday, about 10.30ish. Um, so if you could help, I would appreciate that. Um, it should be relatively easy. Um, I think that's everything. If I seem a little off, it's because I am. My wife and Nora went out down to Lansing to see our new niece, and I have found myself completely out of sorts. <laughs> like, I just find myself wandering around the house, staring, just, what do I do with myself? I, I have not descended completely to eating cereal over the sink, but mostly because we're out of milk and soup's too hot to hold over the sink, but I'm pretty darn close, so uh, if I'm out of it, that's why she's coming home later today, thankfully, and she'll sort me out. And I should be better by next week, so <laughs> thankfully that'll happen. But let's go into our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations, the works of of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He set redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for this opportunity for me to join together with my brothers and sisters in the Lord and to worship you, Lord. I pray that you enter into this place, that you work in this place, that you touch each and every heart, that you open us up to receive what you have today. Have the Holy Spirit flow through this place, changing us, transforming us, turning us into the people you want to be so we can do your work. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I was caught by that line in that song. He, he, the vilest offender, if he believes, he'll be pardoned. It's one of the things I find so enriching about our faith is it calls us to something higher, to something greater. It doesn't say just be a good person, just do the absolute minimum, you know, don't make anybody mad, but it true, calls us to true holiness. And that on its own could be overwhelming. It could be too much. How do I, a very fallible person, try to reach for that? You know, I, I can barely even hit nice some days, and yet I'm called to so much more. And so the balance with that high calling is this wonderful, outpouring, constant flow of grace. And so let's take a moment to reflect on this week. How have you done? How have you fallen short? Because we all fall short. So let's take a moment to reflect, and then we will pray our prayer of confession together. O oh God, You have shown us the way of life through Your Son, Jesus Christ. We confess with shame our slowness to learn of Him, our failure to follow Him, and our reluctance to bear the cross. Have mercy on us, Lord, and forgive us. We confess the poverty of our worship, our ne neglect of the fellowship and of the means of grace, our hesitating witness for Christ, our evasion of responsibilities in our services, our imperfect stewardship of your gifts. Have mercy on us, Lord, and forgive us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you and pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. All the prophets testify about Christ, that everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins through His name. Thanks be to God. Please stand for our response. The Gloria Patre. This morning we're going to hear readings from the Holy Bible. This is the New Open Bible, the New King James Version. I got this in 1995, it was presented to me, but I don't recall who presented it, but I'm reviewing it, and I had reviewed it before, and it's a wonderful version. It's going to be similar to what's going to be projected, so I think you'll be able to follow along. The first reading is from the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 through 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. 
and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. Pray to the Lord for it, for its peace, and you will have peace. The next reading is from the second book of Timothy, chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of, seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation, which is Jesus Christ with eternal glory. This is the faithful saying. We shall also live with him if we endure. We shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful. He cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly divided the word of the truth. And finally, the reading from chapter 17 of the book of Luke, chapters 11 through 19. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then he entered a certain village. There he met ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that they went. They were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face, his feet, his feet giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Where were, not, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were they not found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This week I was uh, drawn to our passage from Jeremiah 29, particularly, maybe even exclusively, because of that beautiful line in this passage, seek the welfare of the city. Besides being a lovely phrase, it also captures what I've noticed is an important theme of mine. Uh, perhaps you will notice some... Uh, interconnection between this sermon and what I wrote in the carillon this month. It wasn't done on purpose. In fact, after I finished writing the sermon, I'm like, man, I probably just repeated that whole thing I wrote. But it's because this is something that has become very important to me. This, this call to care for your city, so to speak. To care for the area that you live through charity, yes, but also through other acts. Uh, what I love about this, this call here is that it calls to care for your city, not just through what we would traditionally think about doing good things, helping the needy, and so on, but being good neighbors and citizens. It's something that has become more and more important to me that part of being a believer in Christ is being a good neighbor, a good citizen, a good neighbor in that, you know, Mr. Rogers uh, sense of being a good neighbor, of just really striving to be a good person, to be a beacon of kindness and gentleness in the world, to care for a place, to be invested in it, and to leave it better than you found it, to be the kind of person that even though the, the person you run into, they might not know anything about you, they just said, oh, that was a pleasant interaction. They, they interact with you and they feel better 
that you care for your area, not, not just by doing good things, but by the simple thing of maintaining where you live, of helping the neighborhood be good, by helping it look and feel and be a place where others want to be. This can be as simple as picking up trash to as complicated as participating in institutions, being on city councils or the rotors or whatever, to participating in various things like that. It's simply put, this call to care for the welfare of the city is to try to make any place a good place, filled with people who work for the good of the city without regard for what is good for them personally. It's, uh, again, I'll turn to the picking up of trash because it's a little bit of a bugaboo and something I'm trying to teach Nora that you don't just throw something on the ground. That's littering and it's wrong. Um, and so it's picking up a piece of trash does nothing for me. In fact, it's kind of gross. You know, you're sitting there and you're like, you don't know where this thing has been and now you got to go wash your hands and you're, you know, you're running around. But the mere act of simply picking up a can or a, something you see on the ground is an act of care that makes it a better place for everybody. And it's a lot like any relationship. In a relationship, if you say, I'm going to put this other person's needs first with the expectation that they'll put your needs first, it actually builds a stronger relationship than simply saying, oh, I'm just going to look out for number one. And uh, by everyone doing this, it actually creates this place that is full of goodness. And so this is something that has become very important to me. It's part of what I believe it means to be a believer, is trying to create, no matter where God ends up placing you, a place of goodness. This idea of welfare is very all-encompassing. It's good, peace, prosperity. So this is one way I believe we are called to live out our, our statement that we're trying to build ourselves around of being deeply rooted and future-focused. We're deeply rooted in this community. And so we, that means we care for it. We build it up. We don't, and we don't just focus on what is good for us, but what is good for those future generations. We think ahead hundreds of years to care for it. Now this was part of the reason this has become such an important focus for me is because, interestingly, it wasn't a focus for the church I grew up in. Now I don't mean this as a criticism of the church I grew up in. It was a very good church. But for them, the focus was always on revival, on saving souls, on doing that kind of thing, on personal holiness. And, and I, when I ref, look back and reflect on it, I find it interesting because it was clear that many people had great affection for the city of Appleton. That's the city I grew up in. In fact, I remember so clearly that my father, who was very talented and had a lot of connections in the denomination I grew up in, actually had many opportunities to go out and preach and to move up in the denomination and become a bigwig. And he always resisted that because of his deep love for the city of Appleton. I unfortunately never got a chance to really talk to him about it, but he just loved that place. He felt a deep and abiding connection to the city of Appleton. It was deep in his bones, and yet I don't think I ever once heard a sermon talking about how we need to seek the welfare of that city. Now, they did it in other ways, but it was never something pulled up. And so that combination of a deep love for the place and this theme that I discovered in the Bible has made this something that's very important to me. And so you'll hear me yammering on about it again and again. And if it gets too much, talk to the deacons and they'll yell at me. That's how this works. <clears throat> so I've come to see and celebrate this call to care, to be invested, to be active in the community. And I was all set. I was rearing and ready to go to give you a nice long, I probably would have went over time, it would have been, you know, 45 minutes, we would have been here long, 
The coffee might have got started getting cold. It was going to be tough, but I was excited to celebrate how we did this. And then, as I was studying, I ran into a snag. And that's always frustrating when you think you know what you're going to do, and then God throws in a snag by saying, like, maybe you should actually study the Scripture. And, not, and that, all that to say is that this snag changed things, but it didn't reverse anything I've said. It's all true. Everything I said about the call to care is there. But there's something different about this passage. Yes, the call to seek the welfare of the city continues to echo through time down to us, but there was a problem, and you probably caught it when Ted was reading. That's the word exile. You see, this wasn't written to people like us. People at home. People who are settled and who want to be here. This was written to exiles. Which brings us to the question of, well, wait a second, who is this Jeremiah and what is this, all, this book all about? And frankly, it's hard to answer because this is an incredibly long and complicated book. Je- Jeremiah was a prophet who was around and had a very long career, decades of experience in a very complicated time in the history of the nation of Judea. He was there for the fall of Josiah, King Josiah, who's considered the last faithful king, and then he watches his nation slowly fall apart, both spiritually and as its status as a nation, and he watches as it loses favor of God as they walk further and further away from the covenant and become this plaything between the great powers of the area, going back and forth between Babylon and Egypt, and you see these governors come in and they're trying to decide what's best for them and they go back and forth and these massive armies march through. It's really terrible. One particular important feature of all this is you see many people go into exile. This isn't surprising. We see it nowadays. If you think of the war in Ukraine and how people are just fleeing from it. Now the difference here is many of the people of Israel, or Judea actually, were taken from there. It was a policy of Babylon to take large portions of the population and move them out and move them to Babylon. And so this happened time and time again. Many of the famous Old Testament stories come from this exile period in Babylon, from Daniel's in the lion's den, all those stories is of this time. And Jeremiah was living and ministering during this period. And so the book explores this concept. And it wrestles with the Babylonian Babylonian exile. An exile is a person barred from one's native country, often for political or punitive reasons. Babylon took the people out of there because they were easier to control in the city of Babylon. It helped them run their, their uh, empire. They would take the best and the brightest, all the leaders, and basically decapitate the nation use, and use them to run their own thing. It was a really good way to just take the winds out of the sails of any resistance because there's always the threat of, well, you could re- revolt, but you know all those friends you have back home i'd hate to see if anything bad would happen to them so you you better pay up and so this is who jeremiah is writing to these exiles in babylon and so that takes this whole passage into an entirely different feel these people he's writing to cannot go home they're in a very different area And this isn't like us moving to, I don't know, Texas, which would be, oh, it's different, you know, it's the other side of the country, but, you know, Americans are Americans. It's always fun to listen to people talk about running into an American in a foreign country, you know, uh, two Americans run into each other in France, and it doesn't matter what their backgrounds are. They're like, oh, another American. Oh, you're from California and I'm from Louisiana. Doesn't matter. We're the same. 
And so these people are in a foreign, crazy land. And part of what makes the punch even harder is God says he sent them there. You can't even write this up to, you know, all those terrible Babylonians. Jeremiah's like, this is, God did this to you as a punishment. And that, that makes this so much harder. In fact, later on in the passage, we find out that it will be 70 years before they can return, which means everyone reading this letter from Jeremiah will probably not be there. Likely it will be their children or grandchildren who return. And, you know, that really gives it a different feel. This lovely call about trying to prosper and build a community and a wonderful group there and seek the prosperity of the city to live, to build, to plant gardens, to get married. It feels so very different when you realize that this is a call to do that by the captors. The Babylonians were their oppressors. As one translation puts it, they are called to work to see that the city enjoys peace and prosperity. Can you imagine reading that? These guys kidnapped me and my whole family, probably killing a lot of people while doing so, brought me all the way over to this godforsaken city, and you're telling me that I need to Pray that it enjoys peace and prosperity? That's, that's not easy. This is a hard call. This call to pray for your captors and work for their peace and prosperity, for their welfare. This is a word that as I looked up, I kind of loved how it encompasses so much. It goes from everything from health and happiness and good fortune. This is what they are to seek for. Not just their own welfare, which we could understand. It's like, hey, you're, you're here. You might as well live. No, Jeremiah tells them, seek the welfare of the city. And well, this suddenly takes on a whole new tone. It makes it so much more difficult. And even all that doesn't finish the issue. Because since this was written to exiles, and I don't feel like an exile, how does this apply to me? Is this one of those passages that, uh, that American Christians love to quote, but when you look at it, you're like, that ain't to you. What you talking about? You know, we love taking passages out of context, and then you read them, and you're like, that doesn't say anything close to what you said. So what do we do? I'm not an exile. I'm home. This is my home. Fremont's my home. The Midwest is my home. The U.S. is my home. I can go wherever I want. I have freedom. So how does this apply to me? How does this passage? Sure, it's beautiful, but you know, there's a certain redundancy. Usually you want to care for your home. So this is all aimed at a very different group, or so it seems. You see, we're already great at seeking the welfare of Fremont and Nuevo County. We get a gold star, an A-plus. We're great at this. this. One of the real strengths of this church is that care. It's one of the things I appreciate so much about the work here. But where we struggle with this passage, where this passage speaks to us and challenges us is as exiles. Because here's the thing, as much as we feel at home here, and as good as that is, it has caused us to forget that we actually are exiles. You see, when we are baptized, we transfer allegiance. We become citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We're no longer just U.S. citizens. In fact, our whole approach to where we live changes Because now we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We care for this area. It's something that we are entrusted from our King Jesus to care for, to be part of. He orders us to go and take care of it. But we're Christians. And by nature, we're outsiders, exiles, waiting for the return of the Lord. And I think this is where the passage starts to 
squeeze a little bit. It makes us a little uncomfortable because it reminds us that in some ways we are just as much exiles as these people from Judea. And if we fail to remember our own status as exiles, our own status of looking for something else, we actually miss the beauty of the message here. That this is a message of hope. Why is it a message of hope? It's a message that even when you are in your darkest, most difficult place, if you allow me to stretch this and take this a little bit further than where the passage goes, exile could mean all sorts of things. It could be a difficult, terrible, hard place. It could be a place of struggling, whether that's financial or personal or whatever that exile is, if you want to make it very personal. And yet, God is saying, thrive. I want you to thrive, and I want you to make the area you're in thrive. How? How can we do that in exile? Why don't we just, since we're Christians, we'll bunker up and we'll just we'll grab what people we can on the way out and then we're flying away? How is this an act of hope? How can we turn outward when as exiles we're attacked? And we find the answer in verse 11, just a few passages lower, when Jeremiah writes this, speaking for God. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. You see, being in exile is actually a hopeful thing because it points us to that future. Another way to say this passage is actually to quote that famous one from John, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son so that we may not perish but have eternal life. In many ways, it's the same promise to these Jewish exiles that we have. You can build a life. You can seek the welfare of this city because you have a hope. You can be a blessing to others because it doesn't matter how they treat you. You have something greater coming along. This passage is actually so much more of a challenge because we are called to seek both the welfare. That does not go away. This challenge to be a blessing, to seek welfare, to health and good fortune. And we're called to balance this with our desire for our true home. And in this tension, we can live because, because of the love of our Heavenly Father, because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and because of the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And so this is the call we have today. To embrace our exile nature while still seeking the welfare of the city. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your mercy. I thank You for this story that we read today of the Jewish exiles in Babylon and how You tell them, I love You and I will be there for You. But until then, plant gardens, build a life, thrive, and be a blessing. Lord, I pray that You help us to live that call out. To be a blessing to our city. Something we're so eager to do. But also, to never forget, like those exiles, never forgot our true home. Where we aim to go. That we are first and foremost citizens of the Kingdom of Heaven. Lord, this tension often seems beyond what we can do. But we know with the power You give us through the Holy Spirit, we can do it. And so I, this is my prayer, that You strengthen us to live in this tension, to seek to be with You and to draw others to You while also abundantly and greatly blessing our city. I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And in response to the Word of God, let us recite 
the Apostles' Creed and joyfully declare what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. It's our monthly opportunity to remember our shut-ins. We don't want anyone to ever feel forgotten. One thing that I, well, I love a lot of things, which is why I'm a pastor, but I love how often we are reminded that we are connected, that whether a loved one is here physically or not, they are still part of us. So we're going to play our shut-in video, and as you see the names, please Remember them in your prayers and pray for them to strengthen them and that God shows them. It's, we definitely want to keep them in our prayers. And I want to mention, uh, obviously, we're thrilled with the birth of my niece. And uh, now right around the corner it will be the, the birth of my nephew, uh, Talon and Marissa, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, are about to have their child in just a couple of weeks. So please keep them in your prayers. Uh, we're... We're very excited for all this. Uh, it's, a, it's raining babies, it feels, which is always fun. Um, so they're, uh, they're wonderful, and, I'm, and uh, we're so excited for this. So let's take this all to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your mercy and your grace, for the blessings you give so abundantly and without fail. Lord, you bless us so much. 
And I also thank you for your, the care you give for, to us in those times of need. Lord, we want to lift up our shut-ins. We want you to care for them, to hold them. Lord, you see that they're not able to be present, but they are present in our hearts, Lord. I pray that your love floods into each and every home there, that they feel your presence. Lord, we lift up Tammy and her friends and family. She just passed away, Lord. We pray for strength and comfort that you're in that situation, that you help and support everyone there, Lord. Lord, we want to lift up uh, Linda, who will be going into surgery soon, Lord. We pray for a quick recovery. We pray for wisdom for the doctors. Guide their hands. We thank you uh, for Barb's sister doing well. We praise you for Yvonne's getting her sixth great-grandchild. Thank you for the blessing of children. We pray for the health of that child and the mother and that everything goes well there. We pray for the Dugans who are not feeling well, that they're still struggling to get over uh, some sickness, Lord. We pray that you, you give them a quick healing uh, and a recovery there. We uh, lift up Barb Clark, a longtime friend of the church, Lord, who has been battling cancer, Lord. We lift her up. We pray for her. We pray for strength, for your intervention in the ceiling, in this situation as the cancer comes back. We lift up Wendy and Rick St. Peter's as they mourn the loss of their son. Lord, wrap them in your arms. Let them feel your love and support and comfort in this terrible time. And finally, Lord, I lift up my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, Talon and Marissa, as they anxiously await the birth of their son. Lord, be there. I pray for health and safety for everybody in that situation. Lord, also, we do not want to forget those you've appointed to be our leaders, those who guide and direct us. So we pray for the president and the governor, for our representatives at the federal, state, and local level, and our mayor, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Give them wisdom and guidance as they lead and direct us, Lord. I pray for peace for them, for strength for their families, for them, their physical health to be upheld, Lord. I also pray for this upcoming election as we all cast our ballots, as we make decisions on the direction of this country. Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom as we exercise our leadership and our direction in this. And I pray that it becomes a moment where we can come together as a nation. Lord, I pray for the blessing of Fremont. You told, you've called us to seek the welfare of our city, and this is our city. I pray for good health, for prosperity, for peace in this city, that it is a place known for its love, its kindness, for a place that people want to be. And Lord, finally, I pray that you strengthen and empower each and every one of us, that we can fulfill the work you have called us to be. You have called us to be disciples, to be blessings, to reach out, to call, to preach your gospel, Lord. I pray that you strengthen and help us to do that. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day thy daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for our doxology. gifts we've given. We ask for you to bless them and use them to do your work. Build your kingdom through these. Multiply them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing Standing on the Promises, number 410.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Go and seek the welfare of Fremont and tell all of why you have hope. Amen.